You cannot underestimate the importance of Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood because without them, none of this would have happened. Without their clothes, without their slogans, without their concepts, without their ideas, without their desire to shake things up, even without knowing exactly where they were going or what they were doing, none of this could have happened. <laughs> For English punk, and for me, it was the sex shop. That's where it started for me. Jordan would often be at the far end of the shop next to the jukebox having a cigarette. And again, it was like entering another world. I mean, it was kind of very, very threatening. Vivian and Malcolm created a whole range of rubberware here, which was really beautiful. And we used to do some pretty heavy bondage stuff. Gold, peep hole, Brazier with crutchless knickers. A whole enclosed pneumatic blow-up rubber mask, which had a ball gag in it, which you could inflate as well. Um, the eyes were also blocked in, so it was a sort of sensory deprivation. Go on, Helen. What about get Jordan to put on some rubber clothes? What clothes? She hasn't told me what clothes. What clothes? I could have the A-line skirt. Yeah, the, not the short one, yeah. the one that comes back here. And, yeah. and the blouse with a zip. Some rubber stockings. And it wasn't a fetish. It was just so tactile and beautiful to look at. Indeed, not all of Sexy's clientele were suburban fetishists. The shop also attracted gangs of kids reared on Bowie, Roxy Music and London subterranean clubs who would come in to hang out and get strapped into the bondage gear as well as to try on those fabulous, revolutionary, provocative T-shirts. Of course, in those days, it was kind of bondage trousers, it was like £40, T-shirt was like £12, so it was like, you know, there was a hell of a lot of shoplifting going on from that shop, that's all I can say, you know, and... Um, it was a kind of the beige hold all world with, um, do you have a jacket to match this, please? Well, let me have a look. <laughs> In the bag. I'm sorry, Vivian. Ezra Pound wrote that true poetry communicates before it is fully understood. Malcolm McLaren obviously understood that when he put two cowboys with their cocks out on the front of a T-shirt. Their use of the swastika is my case in point. They weren't actually trying to say anything about Nazism or fascism or even a totalitarian ideology. They were saying, here's a symbol which we're not meant to use, have a look at this. It's like kids at school. When you get a new book, the first thing you draw on it is a swastika. Well, maybe a big penis with gobbets of cum coming out the top. You might draw that on it first. But after that, you draw a swastika. You're not saying, I'm a Nazi. You're saying, look at that, it's a swastika. No crime at the end. The swastika fitted in brilliantly because it was such a massive wind up, you know what I mean? And when you had like the destroyer t shirt and you had the swastika, it was winding people up. It was just a real fuck you to the generation that had gone before. I don't think it was a, a Nazi or a fascistic statement. They sort of had every kind of political symbol on them all at the same time, thus rendering them all meaningless, I think. Vivian Westwood is, to my mind, the most interesting of those willful spirits who stirred up the insurrection we now know as punk. And perhaps tellingly, she's endured to become the most successful and influential of the bunch. What was it in you and what was it in Malcolm that wanted to, to shock people and provoke people? What was the kind of, what was the ideal outcome of that? I mean, what did you hope to achieve with that? What was it that inspired you and what, where did you hope to get with it? I was absolutely disgusted and angry and wanted to see what could be done to stop the world being such a terrible place. And so you were really sort of trying to say, you know, we don't want this establishment. You know, and the idea of the Queen having a safety pin in her lip, I saw her as the head of this pinnacle of hypocrisy. And we were trying to see if we could make some chinks in it, you know, destroy put a spanner in the works, that business of the swastika and everything, just to make people understand how we felt, because what we were also saying is we don't accept the taboos of society, we don't accept any of those values. Punk rock was the most heroic attempt, youth against age, you know, young people against corruption. 
I remember thinking there has never been anything like this before on the planet. It does make your hair stand on end, anarchy in the UK, when you hear it. <laughs> Amazing. And then what he was doing was just, I'd never seen it before. I'd never seen somebody sort of screaming and spitting and showing off their cigarette burns and, and just being horrible. There was a gig on at, at college at St Albans and a band turned up, and sort of teenagers from London, and they played this awful kind of 60s music that was kind of like, I thought it was a piss take. I thought they were crap. The singer, who I found out was called Johnny Rotten, came up and started chatting me up. A sort of relationship developed. We walked hand in hand around St Albans in dustbin liners. I used to phone him up and his mum would say, oh, Johnny hasn't come home for his tea yet. We saw uh, my accident at the marquee, they were just happened to be walking past it and um, they were literally being sort of attempted to be thrown out of the venue as we were walking past and there was just such a kerfuffle going on, we went in there to see what was going on. It was almost like a performance artist type thing rather than a musical thing, with like chairs flying about. What we didn't know, we only read about it later, was that they were, you know, it wasn't part of the act that they were having a row with the management and he was trying to get rid of them because he thought they were so awful. John Layden, he was the real thing. I mean, he's a pikey from Arsenal, you know what I mean? To be a great front man, you need to be cocky, you know, and Johnny Rotten had it all, really. I mean, he's one of the greatest ever, isn't he? But, but I think sometimes he's just a bit over the top, you know what I mean? Don't know when to stop. Please, I try so hard to be nice. We aren't nice boys. We were fucking nasty little bastards. And we still are. So one minute, boring Britain, nothing going on. Next minute, it seemed there were hundreds of new bands. Here's how it happened. Sex Pistols played live. You saw them and said, fantastic. Realised it was not out of your grasp. You didn't need to be Rick Wakeman. You didn't need a cape. You didn't need a keyboard. You didn't need any real musical skill. You just needed energy, enthusiasm, and the ability to absorb what seemed to be a message and spew it back out there. Of course, there were some brilliant bands that were inspired by the Pistols, the Buzzcocks, Subway Set, X-Ray Specs. You saw them. You picked up a guitar, within a week you were supporting them. How cool is that? My name is Dora. I'm Shan. And I'm the bass guitarist of the Nipple Erectors. And I picked up the bass, it had four strings, I thought that'd be easy to play. And I found somebody that I knew played guitar a bit. And we've had this drummer who we met at the Roxy who played on the biscuit tin. My name's Dora. I met Shane and auditioned him. He was a singer and he did an Iggy Pop impersonation, sort of rolling around my bed sit. And I thought, yeah, he's the, he's the one for, to be the front man. So we kind of rehearsed for about a year and then got a gig at the Roxy. Yeah, yeah! Very worst ones, the ones I liked the best, were the Subway sect, who were bored beyond belief. I mean, that was the really exciting thing about them, because they were so bored. It's a love. There was uh, us, Susie and the Banshees, The Clash and The Sex Pistols on the night that we played the first one. Malcolm gave us a test. He sort of said that we had to rehearse every day for a week. And at the end of that week, he would come and see us. And that would be when he would say yes or no, you know. And as soon as he said yes, I mean, we, we were just trying to practice as much as we could. We only did four songs anyway. That was absolutely terrifying. I think punk was opened a lot of doors for a lot of people, and it, what it did enable a lot of people to do, it's, it, it said to them, actually, you do not, don't have to be employed by the man, as it were. I just want to look like any other, what do I get? 
you can actually do things yourself. You can open doors, you can do your own clubs, you can start your own bands, you can design your own clothes. And for that, as, a, as an emancipator, I think it had no equal.